You're listening to The Real Well Show with Kathy Fetke, the real estate investor's resource. People often reach out to me and ask what I think about a property that they're thinking of buying. And I usually respond, I have no idea. I don't know anything about the property. What does the inspection report say? And they often seem surprised by that. But the purchase price is not the final price if there's a bunch of big ticket items that need to be replaced. And one of those big items is the HVAC system. So on today's show, we're going to bring an expert on the topic to tell us what investors should be looking for. I'm Kathy Fetke. Welcome to The Real Wealth Show. Our guest today, Howard Binder, owns an HVAC company and is passionate about helping people make better decisions when it comes to their home systems. He has a shared passion for cash flowing real estate and says one of the benefits of having a background in the trades is knowing what to look for in a property and not just having to rely on a home inspector because all those future repairs can really affect cash flow. So Howard, welcome to The Real Wealth Show. Thank you for having me. So for those of us who invest passively in real estate, a lot of times we just don't know anything about the the way a house works. And I wanted to bring you on to just give us some insight. And let's let's start with HVAC. What should uh, an investor expect to to have for their rental property in terms of HVAC? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, it's one of the things it's funny because uh, as an inv- personally as an investor in real estate, you know, it's easy to walk into a property and look at the counters or the things you can do to, uh, you know, value add. A, a lot of times people leave out things that you don't think like the air conditioner outside and oops, maybe it's 20 years old or 10 years old. And so the number one thing, you know, when you're buying a, an investment property um, is it doesn't have to be high efficiency. It doesn't have to be top of the line equipment, but you do want to know the age. I always tell people to look for what is the age of the equipment. And honestly, high efficiency, I would view as more of a downside in a rental than an upside. And the reason is because simpler equipment is actually cheaper to repair and it's cheaper to maintain. And so as the landlord, you're obviously going to be liable for uh, repairing that equipment unless you're talking about, you know, triple net or something, in which case it doesn't matter as much to you, but that's more in industrial properties. But on a, uh, when you're talking about a, a residential property, um, typically HVAC equipment is going to have a life expectancy of somewhere to 10 to 20 years. And so we always tell people to be aware of that. And that's going to vary specific by region. Um, and I'm happy to kind of dive into more of that, you know, by some of the yeah, regions. Yeah, no, th- this is good stuff. So 10 to 20 years, that's a big difference. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, definitely. Yeah, at, at Real Wealth, we came up with standards when uh, we were referring our members to people who sell re- renovated properties, basically turnkey rental properties. Uh, turnkey really meant nothing because like, what does that mean? Did you change the HVAC? Did you, is there a new roof? You know, what? What does turnkey mean? And we have our turnkey standards now because we worked with people like you to to help us with that. And I I don't have it in front of me, so I can't even remember what the HVAC one was. But when when buying a rental property, how much life do you want to see left on that on that uh, system? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, the there's really two answers. My preference is either um, it's brand new, so you don't have to worry about it. Or, that's always better. I'll take brand new, better, yeah. right? <laughs> and then, um, and then the other one is almost out. And the reason I say like almost dead, and basically you need to uh, replace it, is because then at that point, as an investor, you can come in, you can and know what to put in and be proactive about putting in the right equipment for a rental. Uh, because we've seen people put, you know, high efficiency equipment uh, in rental properties. But if I was buying a property and it needed uh, you know, system replacement, which I did buy my first rental property actually needed, um, you know, a system replaced when I moved in, but obviously being the HVAC guy, I wasn't going to do that. And so, um, because I, I knew I was going to do that. So we just took a seller's concession and, uh, replaced it ourselves. But, uh, really if you're in a region, it's in like when I said 10 to 20 years, we'll talk about the regions where it's a, a shorter life expectancy and we'll talk about the regions where it's a longer life expectancy. So, uh, it all depends about runtime. And so when you look at areas that are in uh, places with uh, long periods of runtime, like, for example, Houston and uh, Texas, for example, you're going to have a 10 to 12 year life expectancy on equipment because your HVAC runs about nine or 10 months out of the year because of dehumidification. Um, and it 
you know, even in the shoulder months. So you're running your HVAC a lot and that reduces the life expectancy. And when you look in a, a climate like California, for example, if it's like a coastal home in Newport Beach, it might last 40 years, honestly, or more. Wow. Because um, <laughs> like the first, the first system I serviced when I got out of HVAC school was actually my friends and they live oceanfront in Newport. And when I went into his house and I, and I took care of his HVAC, um, the system was about 40 years old and the furnace is still there, but they run it maybe one month out of the year. Um, and it's in terrible shape, but you know, it's, it's Newport Beach. So they don't really need it that much. And then it's hot for a couple of weeks out of the summer and they don't have uh, AC. And so it's one of those things where it's really just how often do you run the system? And so as you can imagine, places like Denver, it's about 20 years. Places like uh, Florida. Why, or- why 20 years in Denver? Because wouldn't you have the heat on a lot? You do have the heat on a lot, but in Denver, basically your heating season, it, it's more, it's a more moderate climate. So basically your heating season is from October through February and we have about four shoulder season months. So September, October, it's still pretty mild. Um, we've had set, you know, 70 degree days in, uh, November, for example, you know, and I've, I remember times during Thanksgiving when it was like 70 out. So we have a very, um, we can't have mild winters, so it really just depends. But because on average, our, our summers are about maybe two to three months, and then our winters are maybe four months of heating, you're talking about a seven-month um, you know, use cycle. And so as a result, it averages out to about 20 years. And the way you- okay. Yeah. And that's, you know, and someone else might have a different opinion. If you, it's like, if you ask five HVAC guys, you'll get five <laughs> opinions. <laughs> um, but that's kind of the industry consensus is, you know, in our market, we tell people to budget for about a 20 year life expectancy. Okay. And then what about a place like Ohio? Um, Ohio would probably be about, about the same, probably 15 to 20 years. Um, Ohio is, is you know, it's a colder climate, um, and you've got hot, muggy summers. And so it's, it's kind of the, it's kind of the same thing, but it's not as to put things in perspective. The reason, um, if you compare like the average highs, and I'm not that familiar with the Ohio market, but I'll use Phoenix for, uh, example, cause I'm familiar with that market. In Phoenix, we quote about a 10 to 15 year life expectancy on the high end. Uh, we've seen systems last longer than on that. the high end. Wow. Yeah. And, and the reason is, is because in the summer, um, it's getting up to 115 degrees, 117 degrees some days. Uh, there was, I think it was two summers ago. It was their hottest summer on record. And they got, they had 60 days in the summer where it was over 110 was the high. And on, you know, as of like next week, it's the, there's already, so it's the start of March and we already have temps in the seventies and eighties in Phoenix. And so we basically have an eight or nine month intense heating season um i would say about eight months where it's like really um running more consistently and it's just it's intense the system doesn't shut off and so the system just got a lot of wear and tear um Mm -hmm. and so the same you know is probably true for ohio but i don't think ohio gets anywhere near those those temperatures if i'm not mistaken it's a little bit more florida would probably get overused a lot too correct yeah yeah so okay well that's super helpful because yeah you can't it sounds like obviously in California, hey, we get, we finally get a benefit, the lower cost on something. Yeah, totally. <laughs> HVAC, you don't yeah. need to heat or cool your home very often. I know a lot when we rented homes when we were uh, first moved to Malibu, most of them didn't even have HVAC. It's like yeah, totally. for the two weeks, you're going to be hot. You're going to have to deal with it. The two weeks, you're going to have to be cold. Put a blanket on. <laughs> yeah, totally. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Okay, so then if so if you're buying a property in Phoenix and and you see that the HVAC is is at 8 years, you've probably got 2 years left of use of that maybe if you're lucky and need to budget that in. So, uh what should they budget in uh for replacement cost? Yeah, so it's going to vary widely like across the country and it's going and I'll give you like some ballpark numbers it's so Phoenix cuz I happen to to know that particular metro. Um, but for, you know, in the Phoenix Metro for a rental property, one thing that you'll, um, you know, and there's a couple things I'll talk about too, because depending on your metropolitan area, um, like in Denver, it's, it's not uncommon for us to replace, let's say just the AC or just the furnace. Like oftentimes you'll see a furnace that might be newer and the AC is older and that hasn't been replaced. And so you can replace one or the other. Whereas in markets where there's a lot of use, like in Phoenix or, uh, you know, in Houston, Texas, uh, somewhere on the coast of Miami, for example, where it's, you know, running a lot, it's, v- it's basically common 
uh, practice to replace both the indoor system and the outdoor component um, if it's a split system. Uh, but ballpark on a package unit, I would say somewhere around 10 grand. Now that's just going to be, that's going to be including installation costs. Um, you could depend, you, if it's a small unit for a small home or something, and depending on the contractor, um, that you hire, it could be cheaper than that. And if you're hiring a big name shop, um, it could be more than that. And so really the way to get, uh, you know, as you know, once you start doing more and more business and more and more rentals in a market, you start to develop a Rolodex. Um, you can ask a realtor for a referral on a good uh, company. We work with a lot of realtors, for example, and they've been a great source of, of business for us and on a referral basis, but that's going to be kind of a ballpark. And then, um, in other markets, for example, like I've gotten quotes because um, on our channel, like on as I mentioned, you know, we have a, a YouTube channel and we get comments from, you know, people all over the country asking us about price sometimes. And, hey, is this a good deal? And some of the quotes I've heard in places like Wisconsin, um, you know, are much cheaper than that uh, for a package system. Or I've, I've heard quotes for like 12 grand for super high efficiency systems in that market, but the cost of living is much lower in Wisconsin. So I think it has to do with labor costs being lower in that market um, and just overhead generally being lower for the business. And you said that you don't recommend an efficiency system on a rental property. Correct. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll kind of, I'll phrase it with some caveats. So there's, if it's an Airbnb, right, and it's a short-term rental or it's a hotel property, something where you're responsible for the bill, the opposite is true. You want to get a high-efficiency system. The reason we say we don't recommend a high-efficiency system is typically in a long-term rental situation, obviously, you're not reliable. You're not responsible for the bill. The tenant is. So there's not going to be a direct, tangible benefit for you putting in higher-efficiency equipment. Uh, they all kind of have the same life expectancy. It's not like higher-efficiency has a longer life expectancy. And it's more expensive to repair when something breaks because the components themselves are more expensive. And so so if it's a rental, pro if it's an Airbnb, you, because you're paying that bill and you'll see a tangible savings, absolutely, you want to go with a high efficiency system. And also you're not reliant in an Airbnb, you probably have a handyman that's changing the filters regularly or an HVAC guy that's going out there to do that. Um, and you might be on a maintenance agreement. And so because you're being proactive about the maintenance on the system, you could then it wouldn't be a bad idea to get a high um, a high efficiency system, but if you're putting it in a long term rental, it's just something, and you're expecting your tenants to take care of it. That's a a big mistake. <laughs> They're probably not going to take care of it, and so you just want to keep that in mind and be aware of it. Um, and so th that's the only reason we kind of recommend against high efficiency systems is because they are more maintenance if they're not maintained. Okay. Um, and how often should you, you said that you've probably got people going out to check in, checking on it. Tell me more about that. What should we be doing to, to maintain our homes properly? Yeah, for sure. So the biggest thing you can do is like changing your air filter, right? It's like changing your air filter is like the HVAC guy is like the equivalence of the dentist telling you to floss twice a day, right? If you change your filter a couple times a year at minimum, um, in a moderate use climate or depending on, uh, you know, it, I'll, I'll, there's a, there's a few ways I can address this because basically if you have a high efficiency filter or like a four inch six filter and I'll explain kind of some of the filters you can use, um, you can actually go longer with uh, between filter changes. And the reason is because those four inch six filters just have a longer shelf life before they get clogged to the point that they cause airflow restrictions, which means they're causing damage to your system. Um, or issues with it functioning properly. But generally, we say if someone, uh, like in Denver, we recommend if someone replaces it in the spring and in the fall, so basically before winter and before summer, they nine times out of 10 will be without problems. And then the exception to that is if they have dogs and cats and lots and dander, maybe kids, you know, just lots of dirt and stuff in the air mm -hmm. that makes the uh, the filters get clogged quicker. Those are going to be things that make you want to change your filter more often. Uh, but generally, at least twice a year, quarterly doesn't hurt. And then if you're if you're someone that's very sensitive with pollen and you're running more efficient, like for your personal home, you're running something that's, um, you know, for allergies where you need to change it um, or you're trying to use a filter that's a higher MERV rated filter for allergen purposes, you're going to want to change that at least uh, probably every month just because it, they will, can get clogged pretty quickly and start to cause uh, issues with your system. 
So what is the best HVAC then for your rental? So the best H, uh, HVAC for your rental is going to be, and I'll talk about a couple different options, right? Because it's going to vary around uh, the country. Now, there's different zones um, that the EPA basically allows you to have. They dictate what efficiency system you can get depending on where you are and in what region. And so in our region in Denver, Colorado, and then in Phoenix, we have different systems. But generally, there's a, a few words you want to keep in mind. or, or uh, terms. One is single stage. Single stage systems on air conditioners or heat pumps are going to be cheaper basic systems to operate. Um, there's less moving parts. You don't need a two stage or multi stage system um, or a modulating system because those are systems that are, they fall into that high efficiency category or higher efficiency category. Um, but just for a rental property, investment property, a single stage system is going to be great. Um, when it comes to uh, air conditioning, you're going to want to go with basically the minimum SEER rating in that region. The caveat to that, again, is this is a short-term rental where you're responsible for the bill. We already talked about how you know going with a higher efficiency system might be, uh, this might not apply. But in Denver, that's a, right now is a 13 SEER. In uh, Phoenix, it's a 14 SEER, and that's going to vary depending on, on the region. And then on the furnace side of things, uh, you're going to want to go for, and, and right now there was a law that was recently passed in Denver where they actually uh, banned 80% efficient furnaces going forward starting in 2026. So for anyone that's in the Colorado, um, you know, and this is not just Denver, it's actually the state of Colorado. Um, some states have started to move forward with high efficiency mandates. This is already true on new construction builds, but on existing homes, uh, an 80% efficient system is kind of our recommendation for uh, natural gas furnaces. And the reason is because a high efficiency furnace, it has uh, moisture in the exhaust because it's a condensing gas furnace. And that's how it achieves that high efficiency rating. So when you hear the term 96% efficient or 80% efficient, the difference is that a 96% efficient uh, furnace has what's called a secondary heat exchanger. And that's where it's picking up that extra 16% of efficiency or that extra 16% of heat from the combustion process before it sends the exhaust outside your home. And so really the way when you hear the term 80%, all that means is that 80% of the heat is staying in the home, 20% is getting wasted out of the exhaust. 80% systems, because they don't have a secondary heat exchanger, they're just much more reliable um, because again, it's that secondary um, heat exchanger, it produces moisture. And so there's just a few extra maintenance steps that if it's not maintained, for example, if the condensate trap isn't cleared out, that is something that will get clogged and it just triggers an unnecessary service call. And so for homeowners, like if you live in the home, obviously you can put in a system like that uh, because you're going to have the HVAC guy out once a year to clean your system and do maintenance and it'll work fine. But if you aren't doing that or it's, like I said, a rental and it's you don't know that it's being taken care of, then an 80% system, I mean, they're just a lot more bulletproof. That's what, you know, we have at the office and I can work on the system here, but we have an 80 percent because it's just, it's more reliable. So. Okay. All right. Yeah. And this is what I often tell people when they, you know, they say, I'm thinking about buying this property. What do you think? Here's the purchase price. Here's what it'll come in for rents. Do you think it makes sense? It's like, how can I answer that? I don't know the condition sure. of the property. That may not be the cost of the property if you end up having to do all these repairs and they're expensive. So again, if someone says a property's turnkey or it's been renovated, find out exactly what was renovated. We like to make sure all the moving parts have been replaced or buy a new home. Then, you know, it's all new. Uh, uh, definitely a new HVAC is, is really, really important unless, uh, unless the one that's already in is fairly new. So what other expenses do investors tend to overlook? Yeah, so the really common uh, stuff is really all the stuff that makes a house work that you don't really think about, right? And so um, that's going to be your electrical, and that's going to be uh, your sewer, right? And so what we tell people to look at, I mean, the most important thing in a home inspection, like when I buy a home, a lot of times I'm looking, I I'm trying to buy something as is, and I, and I kind of put that in my offer. And, uh, you know, sellers tend to like that. Oh, as is, that sounds great. I'm not going to get nickel and dime on the faucet and this, that, and the water heater. And all I'm really looking at is a sewer and the sewer scope because I want to see, is it PVC? Is it clay? Is it cast iron? How 
because PVC, because it's a plastic pipe, if there's not root structures in it or there's not trees in the yard that could potentially, um, you know, root structure could develop through that, you're going to see things like that more common in a clay pipe, for example, or cast iron pipes. And if the pipe is already uh, has compromises, like there's a compromise in the integrity of the pipe, there's certain things you can do. Um, but if you end up having to trench the yard to put in a new sewer line, you're not just talking about 10 grand to replace the sewer line. You could be spending, you know, thousand, whatever it costs to redo the landscaping. And if that involves concrete, if that involves pavers, um, or any sort of landscaping, I mean, it can get very expensive. So sewer line is like your number one source of overlooked pain. And so you can get that scope with a camera. It's normally very, affordable. I mean, I, I want to say maybe 300 bucks or something. It's not an expensive thing to get done. And then when they're in there, if they do find some damage um, where you know that that either might need to be replaced, there's actually a new technology. Well, it's not that new of a technology, but it's a, a newer technology, but they can actually run a sleeve down your sewer line. Um, so they can a lot of times salvage the sewer line and extend the life by maybe 10 or 20 years by putting a sleeve um, to make sure that it, it uh, and I don't know exactly how it works because we don't offer the service, but I just, I know of it. And so that's something you want to keep in mind is really just look at the, the sewer line, get that looked at, know that the condition is good. Um, and then the second thing, aside from your AC, is going to be your electrical panel. And the electrical panel is important because if you have, you know, we all kind of, like I said, take our ele electrical for granted, but if you have aluminum wires without a ground, that can cost you a lot of money. Um, for example, if you have a house that's built in the 1800s or early 1900s, this is very common. Um, and, and if you have a lot of two-prong outlets without a ground throughout the house, um, it, it can cause for a lot of problems to where you really can't even use the electrical. If it's a Federal Pacific or a Zinsco uh, panel, those are both fire hazards. And you can Google fire panel electrical hazard and those will both show up and they're uh, so it's very easy to spot most good uh, home inspectors will be able to catch this and point this out but an electrical panel upgrade itself you know depending on on the size of the home and how much electrical could be I mean, could be five grand could be more could be less um depends if it's just a simple a panel uh and what the wiring's like but like I mentioned, if you have aluminum wiring or you have wiring that doesn't have a ground, that can cause a lot of um, potential issues, especially if you're having to run new electrical, which you don't have to do. And no one's really going to force you to do that. No one's going to force you to bring your house up to code. But if you get a situation where the wiring is compromised and, for example, a short out on each other, which means your hot and your neutral are connected, that means that that whole circuit is toast until that wire gets replaced and it can cause a lot of other issues with wiring <laughs> throughout the house. It can cause fires too, right? It can yeah. cause fires. If the breaker mm -hmm. panel does its job, there won't be a fire because what will happen mm -hmm. is it'll short and it'll trip the breaker. But that's why those Federal Pacific panels and those Zinsco panels have been uh, replaced is because they're known fire hazards. And so it can be dangerous, but if you have a modern panel, that it, it will normally... It's 99.9% .9 of the time it's going to trip the breaker. And that's what that's there for. So, Good stuff. All right. Well, yeah. how can people find out more about you and your company? Yeah, absolutely. So our website's the bhvac.com. Um, we have a YouTube show that I mentioned earlier. So if you're wanting to get uh, HVAC info for your own personal residence or for uh, rental properties, our, our channel is at the HVAC Dope Show on YouTube. And you can follow us on social media at the BHVAC. Awesome. Great to have you here. And thanks for all the insights. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And thank you for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. One of the reasons we love new homes at Real Wealth is because all of the system is brand new. And that really reduces repairs and increases cash flows over time. So if you want a referral to one of the builders that we've been working with at Real Wealth, by the way, we've been able to negotiate much, much lower interest rates, as low as under 5% in some cases on investment property. Just go to realwealthshow.com, join and make sure you connect with one of our investment counselors to find out more about that. And at Real Wealth, we also offer turnkey properties, but to our real income property standards, because turnkey means nothing. There's no definition for it. So we created one at Real Wealth. And again, you can find that 
at realwealthshow.com. Have a wonderful rest of your day and thank you for joining me here on The Real Wealth Show. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. For more information, go to realwealthshow.com.